Uh, my name is Justin Trottier. I am the Executive Director of the Canadian Association for Equality, uh, which has sponsored the billboard campaign that has just uh, been initiated this week, uh, which we are here to, uh, to discuss. Um, to provide a little bit of context, uh, we are doing this as part of a three-part uh, series of billboard advertisements covering different major men's issues. Uh, the first one, uh, many of you may remember, in March of this year was on violence against men. You have a copy of that ad uh, over there to your right. Um, this is the second one uh, in that three-part campaign. Uh, the third one, without giving it away in detail, will cover men's mental health. But today we're here to talk about fatherlessness and parental alienation. And you can see a copy of the ad that is now up in Toronto, just behind our panel um, over there. Uh, this ad is in three locations currently, and we're hoping to put up more uh, in Toronto and in other cities. Uh, the three locations are as follows, at Avenue Road at Row Avenue, on Danforth Avenue at Dawes Road, and on DuPont Street at Dufferin Street, so in three quite different neighborhoods of the city. Um, I should also mention that this is part of a social media campaign. All three ads are to get people talking about uh, serious men's health and welfare issues. We're using the hashtag, Let's Talk Men, so you can uh, follow the conversation or participate in you know, participate in it on, on Twitter, on Facebook, and on our website, equalitycanada.com, on our forum there. Uh, the last thing I'm going to say before I introduce the panel is that this is also uh, the one-year anniversary for our uh, Men's Centre, uh, Toronto's first sort of all-purpose men's health and welfare hub, dealing with a wide variety of boys, men's, and fathers' issues. Uh, here we do uh, counseling, peer support, legal aid. Uh, we do support services for male victims of domestic violence and other forms of trauma. Uh, it's been a really amazing year. Uh, and we think that we're filling some important uh, social service gaps. In particular, on this issue itself, we've just launched last week a program called Fathering After Separation or Divorce, uh, which is really meant at assisting fathers post-family breakup to maintain a healthy full, vibrant relationship with their child or children and to put their children's interests um, first, um, ahead of those of, of, of even themselves. So that's the focus of that particular program and it is one of many services that we offer here at the Centre. So uh, having said that, let me introduce um, the amazing panel that we have for you. And I know you may have questions. They've each been asked to prepare short remarks of no more than two minutes. If you have questions, um, and I ask you to hold them until we're done. If you really need to ask them urgently, uh, feel free to do so. So the first person uh, we're going to be hearing from is Robert Samory. Uh, Robert is the chairperson of CAFE's board, as well as our public policy director. He's also got a keen interest in this issue, being a vice president of the advocacy group Parental Alienation Awareness Organization. So uh, Robert's going to tell us why we're doing this campaign and why we think this is such a serious issue. And then we'll be hearing from uh, parents and grandparents um, who have been personally affected by alienation. Robert. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for, for being here. Uh, I'm Robert Samory, S-A-M-E-R-Y. Uh, and I'm here in my role as an advocate on uh, for children. Uh, caught in parental alienation issues. Um, when sole custody is granted by courts to one parent or another, 93% of the time it's granted to mothers, uh, which allows mothers the opportunity, gives mothers the opportunity to perpetrate behaviors on those children to a much greater extent than dads. They are therefore more likely to be alienating and abusive to their children in this kind of emotionally harmful way than fathers are. Uh, our advocacy group deals with underrepresented issues that discriminate against boys and men. Uh, this certainly has a disproportional effect through men on children than, uh, than the other way around. Um, our current billboard depicted uh, behind me uh, around Toronto shows an abused child caught in the war between her parents being pulled from her loving and loved father. The <coughs> caption reads, I'm not parental prey, help me keep mom and dad. Uh, the harm that children experience when a parent is unjustifiably removed from their lives is at once harmful to their emotional and physical well-being, but is also extremely long-lasting. It's not a temporary issue that is remedied 
with a short fix. The behaviors that lead to it include denigrating the other parent, inculcating the child with delusional, merely exaggerated or outright false beliefs about whether the parent loved the child, whether the parent is a good enough parent, and whether the parent in fact is a danger to the child. Um, history is, is often rewritten in order to accomplish those things and taken for granted that things are as they are said that they are, which is always not the case. Often the police and courts uh, and children's aid societies are co-opted in order to help in the effort to rewrite history, to paint the delusional picture of an unworthy or dangerous other parent. The effects on the child include anxiety, depression, long-term issues with intimacy and authority, and in extreme cases can include both suicide and homicide on the part of the child. The courts are currently more in tune with the harms associated with children under their jurisdiction, but the domestic violence associated with the abuse and victimhood of the child is only beginning to become recognized. Typically, we see these kinds of behaviors during separation or divorce, and the perpetrators are so focused on having control and isolating the child from the target parent that they think nothing of breaching stalking laws or even violating existing court orders to the contrary. This all contributes to a sense that the courts are not working properly and as Justice Cromwell of the Supreme Court of Canada has said, the family courts are in desperate need of reform and of being more relevant to family needs. I brought a number of publications uh, to show you. Many of them deal with the studies around parental alienation. Uh, this, uh, this large volume is, consists of one line, each of references to a, uh, uh, the, the, the professional literature. Um, the other half consists of all of the cases up until a couple of years ago from family courts and appeal courts that have dealt with parental alienation. It's unfortunately an impressive volume. Uh, we have an encyclopedia of parental alienation and a number of other works where uh, family lawyers and judges have contributed to articles about this. Uh, that's all I have for Thank you, Robert. I was just going to say, please take uh, please take seats, those of you who are at the door. Um, as Robert's alluded to, uh, this is very much a, a health issue as well, and this is November is Men's Health Month, and um, there are certainly emotional and mental health repercussions on the father, and also, of course, on the children, and on other family members as well, I should say, uh, resulting from uh, alienation and uh, the uh, the tragedy of the fatherlessness in our communities. We're going to be hearing now from some individuals who have been personally affected as fathers, as grandfathers, grandmothers, and as other members of the extended family. So everybody's going to keep their comments relatively brief, a couple minutes each, all right? We're going to start with William Spotton, who is an advisor to our organization, um, but has also been in the midst of a sustained campaign of alienation uh, targeted at him uh, for four years, uh, which has really compromised his relationship with his daughter, Sophia. Thank you. On Wednesday, June 19, 2013, I was denied access with my three-year-old daughter, Sophia Spotton, by her mother. It was rescheduled for Thursday, June 20th. I had been denied access on at least 12 occasions to that date. On June 20th, I was informed by text of a denial of access for that day. On Friday, June 21st, Sophia's mother informed me that there was a police investigation going on. It was alleged that Sophia's half-brother had touched Sophia's bum. My son at that time was 14 years old. The Children's Aid Society and the local police investigated and found no substance to the allegation. Sophia was never, to be, never able to be interviewed without the presence of her mother. Sophia's mother threatened to file complaints against both the CAS and the police. The police ordered a senior officer to review the file. He confirmed the initial, the initial investigation. 
the CAS reopened their file, attempted to re-interview Sophia at her mother's insistence. Her mother also supplied a video that she had made of Sophia making the statements while being prompted by her mother. Furthermore, the CAS had also, also said that Sophia sounded rehearsed. CS, CAS did not find the allegation credible. Sophia's mother still refused to recommence any access despite the CAS and police findings. I took her to court for contempt. On September 24th, Judge Magda at the Oshawa Courthouse denied the, the, denied the findings but ordered access without the presence of my half-son, Sophia's siblings. The judge found that despite the CAS police findings, their mother had grounds to be fearful. And she had the right to be fearful. My access was recommended, but so, we recommenced, but Sophia has not seen her half-brother since June of 2013. There is no expectation that she will ever see him again. Sophia asks about him regularly. She is trying to learn baseball with me now. She knows that baseball is her brother's favorite sport. On August 10th, 2015, I received an email from Sophia's mother that she had changed Sophia's name and their address. They now live in the middle of a commercial area of town without any residential neighbors. Sophia is not allowed to attend the local public school, which is equidistant from my house and her mother's house. On September 20th, Sophia and I attended our church as we do when she is with me. I have been a regular attendee of church for over 20 years. I'm also a church volunteer. On this Sunday, Sophia's mother was also in attendance and has been in attendance ever since. Except for Sophia's baptism, I am not aware of Sophia's mother ever attending church. At least my church. She now attends her church, including a special family service, the Messy Church, which I organized. As of last Friday, Sophia, when I had access for a weekend with her, which is alternate weekends, Sophia ate okay. She did not sleep well. It took her 24 hours to calm down and relax with me. On Sunday, Saturday night, she had a full night's sleep. I would anticipate within four years I will not see my daughter if this continues. Thank you. Thank you, uh, William. Uh, we're going to hear from George Bigger, um, who has been uh, in a, a situation uh, for a long time um, where he feels that the system has let him down as well as uh, his, his daughter, uh, Grace. Um, uh, he has des described Grace as suffering from separation anxiety and attachment issues uh, as a result of um, a Grace's mother sort of unilaterally deciding to end their agreed to co-parenting arrangement and essentially denying her um, full access to her dad. George. Thank you, Justin. I'd just like to stress also that the law currently states equal access is the rule. Uh, courts still use gray areas, unfortunately, to cling to old paradigms, and even though research clearly shows that's counter to the children's best interest. Uh, I'm a professional person. I have my own financial practice. Uh, I'm a member of different boards of uh, uh, directors. Um, nobody has ever cast any single negative uh, issue in regards to my, myself or my personality. Uh, I take a positive approach to life and I actually raised five children, three stepchildren and two children, very successfully in a co-parenting environment with, a, with a, uh, a former spouse that was very cooperative and I've seen what good can come of that. Um, unfortunately, in this situation, um, even having the experience of raising five children, uh, the oldest of which was uh, my stepson with special needs with autism and Tourette's, and he even is very successful. I had two very, very successful children of my own. Um, but uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, the courts have not recognized my parenting abilities, even though they could be characterized as being very, very strong. Um, I've been the voice of reason throughout my ordeal. Um, which really came to a head on August the 5th of this, this past summer, whereby um, my daughter's, my 20 month old daughter's um, mom decided unilaterally to quit her job and pull my daughter out of daycare. So when I went to the daycare, she wasn't there. Uh, she refused in writing to allow me to, to my daughter to spend time with me, even though we, we had been in a co-parenting co situation. And my struggle ever since has been to have the courts recognize that this this has happened and to uh, and to right the wrong. Um, essentially she was rewarded for her actions because even upon an urgent motion which the court uh, grateful granted me, I now see my daughter one day per week, Saturday 10 a.m. to Sunday at 10 a.m. 
I'm, I'm again in court uh, this coming Friday, as a matter of fact, to try and get that equalized once again. Um, but it's a very long and drawn out process. And throughout that process, I've become an, an, a, a supportive advocate for other parents in, in the same situation. I've spoken to people across the country that I've found, you know, through Facebook and different support groups. And I can tell you that this is devastating. Now, I'm 45 years old, and I, I have a patience that maybe, maybe some younger men don't have. But I can tell you that um, I have spoken to people at length two, three hours on the phone, and these fathers have, have described to me the fact that they've, because of the unilateral decisions of others, have had to drive 1,600 kilometers round trip to see their daughters or their sons. Um, and it's just devastating. Uh, it devastates families. It makes it difficult to, to carry on. I can tell you that through this process, I've almost bankrupt myself. Um, and that's not legal fees. That's because it's very hard at times to get out of bed in the morning and carry on with life. Uh, if you can imagine having one of your children literally abducted and taken, some, taken somewhere not knowing where they are, it's a very similar situation. Unfortunately, the courts endorse it in some cases. Um, uh, I'd like to just very quickly uh, demonstrate a few of the, 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 the aspects that research has actually found. Because this is an opinion. Um, research shows that to toddlers securely attached to fathers are better at solving problems. Six-month-old babies score higher on tests of mental development if their dads are involved in their lives. With dads present in the home, kids manage school stress better. Girls whose fathers provide warmth and control achieve higher academic success. Girls who are close to their fathers exhibit less anxiety and withdrawn behaviors. Parent connectedness is the number one factor in preventing girls, and I'm going to speak mostly towards girls because that's where my, my research has gone, uh, to prevent girls from engaging in drugs and alcohol. Daughters who perceive that their fathers care a lot about them, who feel connected to their fathers, have significantly fewer suicide attempts and fewer instances of body dissatisfaction, depression, low self-esteem, substance use, and unhealthy weight. Girls with involved fathers are twice as likely to stay in school. A daughter's self-esteem is best predicted by her father's physical attention. Girls with a father figure feel more protected and have higher self-esteem. They're like, more likely to attempt college and are less likely to drop out of college. Girls with fathers who are involved in their lives have higher quantitative and verbal skills and higher intellectual fun functioning. Girls with good fathers are less likely to flaunt themselves to seek male attention. And fathers help daughters become more competent, more achievement oriented, and more successful. Girls with involved fathers wait longer to initiate sex and have lower rates of teen pregnancy. And teen girls who live with both parents are three times less likely to lose their virginity before their 16th birthdays. 76% of teen girls said that fathers influenced their decisions on whether they should become sexually active. A daughter from a middle class family has a five-fold lower risk of out of wedlock pregnancy if she lives with her father. Girls who live with, with their mothers and fathers as opposed to mothers only have significantly fewer growth and developmental delays, fewer learning disorders, emotional disabilities, and behavioral problems. Girls who live with their mothers only have significantly less, sorry, who live with their mothers only, have significantly less ability to control impulses, delay gratification, and have a weaker sense of conscious or right or wrong. When a father is involved in his kids' day-to-day -day activities, they are more likely to confide in him and seek his emotional support. And kids do better academically if their fathers establish rules and exhibit affection. That's not just opinion. That's, that's research. Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, we're going to uh, broaden this uh, conversation now to also talk about the effect not just on fathers and children, but also on the extended family. And the theme here is that when a father is alienated, or any parent for that matter, uh, it has the effect of alienating an entire side of the family from the child or children. So with that in mind, Jim, would you like to speak to this? Yes, I would. Um, just to introduce myself, uh, I am uh, the president of uh, CAFE. And, uh, and I have been uh, dealing with, uh, particularly with boys' issues, for uh, a number of years. Um, somewhat unexpectedly, I became involved in this whole issue of parental alienation, or in my case, grandparental uh, alienation, uh, uh, because of instances in my own family. And I think it's really tragic. It's hard on them, certainly hard on the grandparents speaking as a grandparent, very, very hard on grandparents, but it's it's unbelievably hard for children. Children are have been my focus for many, many years. Because a child doesn't only lose one parent. Um, a child who, whose 
custodial parent is is poisoning the atmosphere of that child is uh, putting that child in a position of losing one whole side of the family it's like it's like one whole dimension of that child's life disappears and if anyone think that thinks that's inconsequential uh, then I would direct you to the research because there is quite an extensive body of research in terms of uh, long-term losses that children experience when they lose contact with one whole side of their family. So it's difficult for the grandparents, it's difficult for aunts and uncles, and it's difficult for cousins and, and so on. But the long-term damage is going to be the, to those children who will miss one segment of their lives um, and each day that passes can never be recovered so it's not like you say well they'll come to they'll come to grow past this and they'll understand better years from now fine but all those years that they've lost all that experience they've lost is gone forever so a, when a, when a when a parent makes a decision a custodial parent makes a decision to uh, eliminate any contact with the other parent and I, I'm, this is regardless of whether it's males or females doing this um, the, the long-term consequences for the child aren't only the loss of that one parent They're the loss of part of your heritage part of your life part of your history part of who you are and that never comes back so it's a, I'm, I'm speaking from personal experience, but I'm also speaking uh, from what the research tells us, and I have written extensively on these issues. Some of my own books are, in fact, on display here in this room. So, um, Justin, I think it's a, it, an issue that uh, we very often don't pay enough attention to because we get caught up with the immediate issues of dad and mom. But, you know, if there are people sitting in this room who don't remember their grandparents, I feel very badly for them. Because what an enormous loss that is. Thank you so much, Jim, for sharing that. Um, we're going to, uh, we have two more uh, quick stories to share with you. Um, and again, to sort of broaden the conversation. First, I have Diane Marston here, um, who is a mother who was the target of parental alienation for three years, and uh, also uh, one of the um, organizers for an organization called Child Alienation Support and Information Network Ontario. And I do want to reiterate again, we've been focusing a lot on fathers and that side of the family. That is not to say that a mother can't also be subject to alienation, but as Robert said in the introduction there, um, because of the way custody tends to be assigned to a mother rather than a father, and that's a whole issue with uh, with our family court system that, that will be the, probably the subject of a future campaign, and you can read more about it on our website, it's more likely that, that a father will be in a situation uh, where he will face alienation and his side of the family, as we've heard uh, from Jim, who we'll be hearing uh, from Dom in our final story, uh, that that can take effect. Uh, so with that, I'm going to introduce Diane. Thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, I am a mother that has been targeted with parent, parental alienation for three years since the breakdown of my marriage. And I just want to say it's not limited to one gender. It affects all members of the family unit. My children and I have been victimized by the alienating parent, and I'm here like we all are, to protect our children from being abused. Um, the American Psychological Association stated in 2014 that child psychological abuse is just as harmful as child sexual abuse. Children should not have to choose between two parents who love them equally. Parental alienation further tears family apart by shredding the very core of this relationship between children and the alienated parent, making it one of the worst forms of child abuse. This effects, the, this effects of this abuse will be with our children for life. I want to say that parental alienation is not just a protection a custody issue, it's a protection issue as well. I have two autistic children 
and um, my my story is involved with being able to protect my kids. I am able to see my kids on my access days uh, only because I have taken a shorter access time. I was forced because I couldn't keep going in the legal system. I financially was drained. So um, when my kids are in my access time, they tell me they want to stay longer. They tell me that my, my ex is saying negative things. They don't know how to understand and how to cope with this. And basically, I just keep things very positive for them. I'm very emotional. This is a very emotional subject for me. I've, I've struggled for the last three years of how to do this and stay strong for my children. And I will continue to do this. This is for their rights, not for mine. And um, with everybody together, I think we all will band together and we'll be able to eliminate what's going on in our family court systems to be able to bring families together because children do need two parents that equally love them and they equally love us. Thank you very much, Diane, for joining us here. Uh, the last um, story we're going to hear from uh, is from Dom Vetro, Vetro, Vetro sorry, I mispronounced that. Um, and uh, he's also come with some family members, including his mother. Um, so this, I think, will round out our press conference nicely because uh, his situation is, a, is a, an unfortunate but a good example um, of how it really does affect the entire family, not just the father, but in this case, the grandmother, the grandfather, aunts, uncles, cousins, family, uh, other members of the family and the friends as well. Uh, so if we can, uh, those of you who uh, weren't here when we started, uh, we mentioned that when we get to this uh, concluding story, we're gonna ask you to turn the cameras off um, to preserve uh, their, uh, their privacy. So uh, Dom, uh, would you like to come up? And Laura as well, you're both welcome to. And we can, we can put out some chairs. And with that story, we will, uh, we will be concluding and of course open to your questions. We will be also talking about some recommendations that we're going to be putting forward, and they do include a legislative agenda with respect to making equal shared parenting the, the default presumption when a family does break down. Uh, we will be talking about uh, really pushing the seriousness of this. You've heard this described as child abuse a few times. Um, there's good literature to support that. We would like to have medical professionals acknowledge the severity of this issue and incorporate that into their counseling and therapy solutions uh, when families break down. And we're also going to be pushing some programs that we are uh, beginning to host here at the Center for Men and Families that I mentioned earlier, this Fathering After Separation or Divorce program, which is meeting here every Wednesday night. Um, this is something that I think is uh, essentially without precedent, trying to focus on uh, keeping a father and, and his child or children together, giving them resources and tools to work through the challenges post-separation or divorce um, in the best interest of the child. We, we hope that this is emulated um, in other uh, social service agencies and across Canada. So we're very excited about that. Um, there are also going to be a lot more stories that we will be sharing. Uh, but with that, uh, let me conclude, let me thank you for your extended attention. I know this was a little on the long side for a press conference, but I appreciate your indulgence. Um, and of course, thank you to uh, uh, my, uh, my heroic uh, panelists here for sharing your, your very touching stories. If there are questions, uh, we will gladly take them at this time. Jonathan. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone who appeared. I know it's a very painful subject for people to talk about, so thank you for sharing the story. The thing that interests me is um, how much, even if you were able to push a legislative agenda, how much courts or lawmakers can do, because in terms of access, you can say we have 24 hours access, 48 hours, like you can measure it. But it strikes me that parental alienation is this constant drip, drip, drip of criticism and abuse that kids are exposed to of the other parent is, you know, that parent doesn't love you, they lie to you, like, that's my understanding that takes place over years, and how do, even if you could get legislation against parental alienation, how would that ever be enforced, because it's based on the private conversations between the alienating parent and the child? Right, Justin. Um, William, did you want to yes. um, that? Ideal, uh, I have a friend who actually successfully um, had, there was an initial annihilation campaign, and it was the drip drip, but he was able to, it never took full, it never went to the full extent that it has for other parents along here, because he had over the 40% access. So 
His trip trip back was, I'm good, I'm loving, and then the evidence came itself. The child was able to sustain and have the evidence proven by seeing dad, seeing the other parent, a substantial amount of time. The, st the trip trip isn't true. It's going into the ground, it gets soaked up, it's not staying in the bowl. And the only thing that guarantees that is that you have the access time, so it's relatively equal. And again, there's lots of circumstances going towards equal parenting, but geography, things like that. So the follow-up question, I guess, is are you aware of any precedent in law where as a family a family judge has actually said to one spouse or a former spouse, you are not allowed to, to denigrate the other spouse, you are not allowed to tell lies? There's, like there's, there's, there's a ton of case law that talks about how to deal with an alienated parent. Once you've identified that there's a potential, not even an actual harm, but a potential for harm, at the extreme end, what the courts have done is they've said, we're going to set up a therapeutic program. You're welcome to attend or not, but the child and the other parent are going to attend. In the meantime, you're going to have no access. They typically do that for a six-month period. <clears throat> at the end of six months, they take another look at the family and decide whether or not that parent is ready to be reintroduced and can support a relationship with the child and the other parent. If not, they're not allowed back in. So in, in effect, there's a restraining order placed against the alienating or potentially alienating parent to not be involved with the child at all. So that these harmful drip drips have no, 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 uh, no opportunity. And this is relatively frequent today. I wouldn't have said that three years ago. So there's been progress, you're saying? Well, let's, yes, there has. That's for those who can afford that form of justice. Diane and I are in the same circumstances. I can only sell my house once. The problem is that it's, 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 it's recent. It's not completely accepted as, a, as a, a form of therapy. The argument against this kind of uh, regime is that the child's best interests is, is, uh, should dominate. And some people, some judges, therapists are not included in this category. Some judges are still hesitant to uh, put the child into a temporary state of harm, removing them from an attached other parent, when that's exactly what needs to be done. So I think when we come back to this in another five and certainly 10 years, you'll see that as being more the case, uh, maybe even universally. Uh, but there are laws currently on the books in various other jurisdictions that ban people who are alienating their children. Thank you. Are there other questions? Well, I'd like to make a comment because the, the alienation that you're talking about in the law, that only happens if they're under the age of 14. That um, there could be help because after they're age 14 and the courts Really well, that's an interesting back. point, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you of a BC case that was recently decided within the last year that took the kind of regime that I was speaking about and applied it to a then 17-year-old child and made sure that it would be in effect for at least a year, making that child over the age of 18 when family courts typically don't have jurisdiction over children. So that, number one, speaks to the effect of the, the, the regime of the, the, the therapy, and it also speaks to how some courts have found the long-term consequences of alienation so damaging, so damaging, that they're prepared to extend that uh, age of minority in their jurisdiction in order to combat it. Yeah. My son was alienated from me for two years. I never talked bad about his dad, even though his dad had talked so bad about me. And it wasn't until maybe a year and a half of resuming contact with him and getting it stronger and stronger that he finally came to me and said, what happened? Like, what is the truth? Because his oldest brother was questioning his dad and he was having mentioned anxiety like he was having extreme anxiety he 
was at university, he couldn't cope with his friends anymore. And, you know, well, that's... I explained it to his father. I mean, sorry to my son, and we both cried about it. And he is in such a happy place right now, like having a relationship with me. I don't know what his attitude at his, and what he said to you at the time he was being alienated, but typically what happens is that the child has a very black and white view. This parent is all good. This parent is all bad. That parent can't do anything that's good. In fact, that's why I don't want to spend any time. I don't want to see them. I don't want to be in touch with them. I don't want to know anything about them. When those children who are so extreme in their views are given the opportunity to spend even a few hours without the influence of that alienating parent, with the target parent, what typically happens is they immediately come back. And one story that I've heard from a psychiatrist who said that this, this eight-year-old child had to be forcibly removed from his mom's house in this case in order to go see his dad who we hadn't seen in a long time because the dad was dangerous and the dad was no good and he didn't want to spend any time. The police came. They drove him to the father's house. He had to be pried out of the police car. He was taken into the house, the door was shut behind him, and as soon as that door was shut, he ran up the stairs, he said, Dad, stand at the bottom, I'm going to jump, catch me like you always did. Do you know what kind of trust that takes? Yeah. Like that, the child turned around. That's not typical, <laughs> but it does exemplify what happens to these children at the beginning and how easy it is in the proper circumstances to turn them around and and reverse much of the damage that was done. I have a comment um, about uh, similar to Lisa's. Um, my, uh, the mother of my children, she strategically waited till my daughter turned uh, 14, actually a few days before, so that um, what I was told by lo uh, legal counsel that was rep representing me at the time, that there's nothing they can do. And I pleaded and begged um, pages and pages in my affidavit of um, not just alienation that occurred afterwards, but um, as part of the strategy for the separation. Um, and um, uh, because each of my four children were over 14, uh, my pleas and my begging was like deaf ears in the court. Not one court endorsement addressed it. Um, and uh, there is nothing I can do. I contacted the Parent Awareness Association. Um, and talked to the president at that time, and um, there's, you know, explaining, you know, maybe take a passive approach and, and try to slowly, you know, uh, get the children back in your life. And that strategy didn't work, and you know, now it's seven years later, no intervention by the courts, which is very sad. Uh, I'm happy that in BC that they, uh, there was some accommodation with with the child at 17, because. Um, to, to have a child at 14 make a decision when they're in the household of the parent doing the alienating, it's very difficult. So, it, you know, it, um, in my case, when I learned of my um, ex-wife's uh, affair, which was two years earlier, it would have been strategically better for me to have um, filed or separated at the time because at least I would have had three of my children still with me. Uh, because they were under 14. So I think there's got to be some change there, and I don't know in the Ontario court system if what, what's happening, but um, as I mentioned, in my case, there's been no intervention whatsoever, despite my even crying in the court, you know, whether it be a hearing or affidavit. And I, I even brought my affidavits here today, so you can see where there's volumes of, of begging to see my children again. Did anybody want to respond to that? Well, I was just going to sort of add, because Jonathan uh, alluded to the fact there has been progress in case law, common law, but as Robert will say, I mean, case law is piece by piece, and judges can discriminate which cases they need to follow. What we're talking about advocacy here is statutory, getting the statute law down to catch up a bit to where some of the case law is going. There are jurisdictions as well where access, as we all know, we have a, we have a statutory empowered agency here to enforce financial court orders, but they do not enforce access orders. There are jurisdictions in North America, particularly Michigan, that will enforce an access order, which, with that power, 
an alienating per parent who wants to alienate can deny access, and the only resource you have is like myself, it took six months and fifteen thousand dollars to go to court to find out the mother's justified in, in withholding access if she's fearful, despite what the CAS and the police say. So, I mean, what do you do? We need also accessible justice. Case law is great, but case law is seventy thousand dollars to get one of those pieces of paper written. You need seventy thousand dollars in your back pocket. If I could just add to that, uh, the question really in my mind is this: uh, In my own case, I have more parenting experience than uh, my daughter's mother. I have professional and personal character beyond reproach. I'm a father that has clearly demonstrated a strong willingness to parent and a, and a want to parent with tremendous support from my relatives and my teenage children whom I have a close bond with. I have a spotless, beautiful home. I have uh, endless love and patience for my children. I'm a great dad by all accounts. Um, I have a strong bond with my 20-month-old daughter despite only having one, one day a week to spend with her. Um, sorry. So if the courts do not see me as a viable parent, why do we bother with laws that state equal parenting rights? Okay, uh, exactly how high is the bar being set? So the laws state that it should be equal parenting, but they use a gray area, and, and the court system just hasn't got their head wrapped around, despite the research, despite all of the stories in this room, and there are a million more across Canada. Why does the system force me to be engaged in a long, <coughs> punishing, drawn out cage match simply to realize that law which states my, clearly my daughter's right to have equal access to both parents? The truth is the bar is routinely unobtainable and real reform has never been accomplished. So even though the overwhelming uh, number of normal citizens that I speak to every day on this topic believe what we believe in this room, that uh, it should be equal parenting, they've seen the evidence themselves, um, it doesn't happen except in extreme cases. And as some other people have said here, you, you can only sell your house once. I'm self-represented and it's basically almost cost me my career and everything I've ever owned. And I'm only halfway there at that. I just say, while agreeing with whatever is said about the legislative and judicial challenges, for us, this campaign is also one of public awareness and consciousness raising. We want parents to understand the consequences of their actions on their kids and to choose co parenting arrangements that are in the best interest of their child. We want public pressure to come to bear in situations where that isn't happening. That's a, a real force as well, and cer certainly something that can happen immediately while these other legislative and judicial um, uh, initiatives are being, are being worked on. So we're approaching this from m many different angles. And one of the reasons we're coming out with this campaign now is in anticipation of the holiday season, where many children anticipate being with both parents and are sometimes excluded from being able to do that. Exactly. This is all part of a cultural shift. See, legislation can be put in place we need a cultural shift. We need to, we need to do things differently. We need a culture is how we do things. So we need to do things differently. And part of the cultural shift is getting, is getting the default position to one of parents will love their children more than they hate each other. And that's the cultural shift that we need. That people will say, as much as I despise my ex. I love my children more. And when you've adapted, adopted that cultural shift, legislation may help, but, I, but legislation by itself, uh, without that cultural shift, means that people still operate on the basis of saying, uh, I'm going to punish my ex by, in effect, punishing my child. And, um, and that's that becomes the way we do things around here. So it's a, putting up a campaign like this is raising awareness, but also planting the seeds for a cultural shift that we need. Thank, thank you, Jim. I think what we'll do now, unless there are, are there any last questions? Jonathan, and then hello behind you. I already asked a question, if you will. Sure. Paul. Um, it's, it's somewhat of a question and a comment, right? Or a comment question. Um, for me, the biggest issue is really uh, the judges, right? It's like that big elephant in the room. He knows the law. He knows that abuse is being committed. He knows the damages that the, uh, that this is 
being produced because affidavit after affidavit, evidence after evidence that I've personally submitted, right? And yet, he will even sit there in court and said, I did not read your affidavit. Right? <laughs> yes. right? Yeah. The lawyers know what is happening. They negotiate among themselves and they do not represent uh, the law. They represent what they decided among friends. Right. It is disgusting. It's deplorable. It is profiting off of the demise of children. Okay? And it is extremely profitable. This is a racket. And what I would like to understand is what sort of repercussions is there, uh, whether it's from the federal, etc., against maybe the barristers that permit judges to use the conflict between parents and allow children to be destroyed for their personal gain. Where is the repercussions to all of this? Well, there, that, is there that, law? That, that, that's something that you have to stand in front of a courthouse and demand. The processes are in place. <coughs> they aren't effectively used. It's one of the complaints that many people have about the family courts in particular, and I think it's one of the reasons that Justice Cromwell, as I uh, said in my opening remarks, was part of a panel to look into how family courts could be more effective and what changes need to be implemented in order to make them more relevant. John? Sir, uh, you talked about the cultural change. Um, in terms of the culture, um, one thing I've noticed actually just in some spectacular fashion a couple weeks ago is, um, is there is a somewhat knee-jerk cultural reaction to the whole idea of men's rights. And I know this group today is not, it's not a men's rights group. But there are... Uh, we trolls, you mean? <laughs> yeah, some, some of them. But I, just, I have noticed, especially on, on campuses, there's this idea that any group that speaks in a way that could be loved broadly uh, in the category of men's rights, um, it's kind of assumed that it's, it's a misogynistic group. Um, how much has that been a barrier to the messaging on this? I can speak to that, Justin. Well, well, pick up on it, but you start with I'll it. Let me say that it's because... We probably all have some things to well, say. Well, I do, it. because I mean, I, when I was looking for people that were speaking about issues that were important to me, this is one of the first groups I came across. And I must admit, because of my political background, I sort of was very, very, very wary. And I subscribed and I monitored for a long time before I reached out <coughs> and joined. And that's... So that's a long... So when you monitored to make sure it wasn't a uh, misogynistic group? Yeah, I wanted to make sure there were... were, were we're a bunch of angry men that were looking for revenge. They were looking for the right thing, justice. So I'll let Justin pick What did you there. discover? That you're, well, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Very leading question. Are you angry? Are you um, angry? Are you no, angry. I'm beyond anger. I, I'm resolved. <laughs> I, I just want to say one other thing. Anger is a step out of fear. <clears throat> I've, I've been writing this this very modest little space, but it's actually been very actively used by uh, I would say hundreds now of clients of our counseling programs or peer support programs or legal clinic. Uh, I mentioned programs for, or there's probably another client calling right now, um, for male uh, victims of domestic violence and other forms of trauma. We've been getting a lot of people seeking out our support. Um, they seem to find us credible. They seem to find us um, uh, authoritative on these issues. They seem to think that they can get support from us. So it hasn't stopped those people from seeking out our assistance in many different ways. The other thing I've been very pleasantly surprised by is how many referrals we've been getting from healthcare agencies, from hospitals, um, even from women's shelters, uh, which is surprising, uh, but very, very pleasant to, to see that. Uh, because there haven't been a lot of men social service agencies, men who are in need and they are out there will seek support where they can. And often that means that they, if they're, for example, victims of domestic violence, they will reach out to uh, women shelters because there are no men shelters specifically for them. And these women shelters have been referring them to us, um, not in every case, I'm sure, but in about eight or nine cases that I can think of just in the last six weeks, uh, we have had calls uh, actually from women shelters. And again, I think what this tells me is that on the ground, when your interest, as ours is, and as uh, these, these women shelters are, for example, is in helping people, the ideologies break down, the gender warfare breaks down, and you're just looking for resources and services that you can provide to people who need help. So when we get calls to us and we can't help the individual with their issues, we refer them to other credible agencies. And more and more of those agencies see us as part of the 
matrix of social service uh, options here in Toronto uh, and actually beyond Toronto as well and they're referring uh, those individuals to us. So I think we've done a, a, a fairly good job of positioning ourselves as a credible organization that can offer important services that can fill major gaps in, in men's health programming. And I don't think that would have been possible if this gender warfare ideology um, was as prevalent as perhaps on campus it does tend to be. And, you know, we can have a, an interesting conversation about why the campus uh, has become so dominated by this. Um, but in terms of actually trying to be practical and helping people, I think uh, this is where we've actually been, uh, been quite <laughs> successful and uh, would not have been able to do what we're doing if we weren't able to establish these collaborative relationships. We could just end by pointing to one final example, which is a conference that we hosted three weeks ago now on uh, trauma uh, for survivors of trauma and domestic violence and sexual assault. The theme this year was male survivors that had not been done in many years. And we did this with other organizations like the Center for Abuse Awareness and the Gatehouse and their materials behind, uh, behind you there um, on, on the wall. And these are well-established organizations that would not be working with us if they saw uh, the misogyny or the, the ideology um, uh, uh, that, that you were referring to. So I think when we look at what's actually getting done, there's actually a lot of progress that's being made. Um, but as we're hearing uh, today, there's quite a bit of work to do, at least on this particular uh, file. So I hope that gets to what you're asking there. Um, are there any other questions? Anybody have any comments? Yes, Jeff. I have a question. Um, we talked a bit about culture and as well as the legal system. Is there, I assume that a lot of human behavior is goal-oriented, and I'm sure that parental alienation would be no different. Uh, if we assume that, is there anything that the legal system could change to reduce the incentive to to be an alienating parent or to perpetrate alienation? Uh, anyone can answer it. Have any, any ideas? The the, uh, the goal of an alienator is to control their child. Uh, if they find that there's an opportunity to, to to get there easily, they'll take it. The courts give sole custody on whatever basis they, they make a decision. If it was extraordinarily difficult to get sole custody, there would be far less uh, uh, incentive for someone to try and alienate the child to say, I want you and I don't want him or her. So equal shared parenting, I think, is one pretty good option. If I can speak to that very quickly, if there was a mechanism in the court system <laughs> Uh, maybe as a separate, uh, because when things happen, for instance, I wasn't able to bring an urgent motion initially prior to a case conference, even though I had already brought a matter in May and this was in August. Um, there's, n there's no mechanism. I had to uh, request leave of the court to bring my urgent motion just to see my child. I, I went six weeks without seeing her. Um, and that was because of a unilateral decision made by her mother in the, in, just on her own, decided this is what was going to happen. I, 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 I uh, there was no court order in place and that was the issue, but there should be some parallel track whereby when this happens, it's sorted out very quickly. Uh, children's aid won't get involved in matters of custody, generally speaking. Uh, there was no mechanism for me to right the wrong at that point. It was just basically, well, you're along for the ride now. And if I wasn't able to defend myself or to represent myself in court, I would have had to sell everything that I had in order to do this. Right? So, and I, I can't call myself successful at this point. I'm hopeful that the court will be progressive enough and that will be the case. But at the end of the day, one person's decision in one moment can ruin lives. And there's no mechanism to immediately turn that around. It's a long, drawn out process. Thanks, George and Robert. Any other questions? I think what we'll do is we'll uh, conclude the press conference there. If there are questions that you have for individuals, um, will each of you be around for a little bit longer to take those? That would be excellent. Sure to send us coffee, right? <laughs> we will make some coffee for those who stay with us today, uh, for sure. Uh, but thank you so much for being here today. Do visit the website equalitycanada.com slash alienation. There's a lot more information on there. Uh, you can take a look at the material that we've presented here today and follow us on social media with the hashtag Let's Talk Man. Thank you, and thanks to the panel. Thank you.